discussion on utilizing intelligent process automation for document intake, understanding and digitization. Sean Nicolella is the AVP for digital automation with MetLife and Tom Wilde is the CEO with Indigo. Please take it away, gentlemen. Great, Jordan. Hey, Sean, great to talk to you today. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining the panel discussion. Sure, Tom, happy to be here. Good stuff. Uh, well, what we thought we'd do here for this discussion is, is go through uh, sort of a, a bit of background and, and almost a case study around MetLife's investment in automation broadly and then more, specific, more specifically, more recently, um, your investment and in, in deployment of intelligent process automation using cognitive capabilities um, to solve some of the more complex use cases uh, that you encounter at an enterprise the scale of, of MetLife. Um, but what I thought, Sean, is maybe start by talking a bit about automation broadly. So, you know, you've, you've uh, taken up the mantle of, of driving automation initiatives um, with your team across MetLife. What have you found to be, you know, just generally about automation, the, the tougher part about deploying um, at MetLife at the scale that, that you guys have and, and the, the sort of breadth of the business units and complexities that you see there? Sure, Tom. So, you know, thanks for the question and, uh, you know, thank you very much for having me today. It's a pleasure to get an opportunity to talk to you about automation and also speak a bit maybe about some of the great work that we're doing together. So, uh, you know, getting to your, your first question, I think one of the tougher initial challenges that we've seen both from the realm of RPA as well as intelligent automation has been the initial expectation setting. So before we even get into the complexities of delivering on these, uh, on these use cases and delivering on these technologies, I think that our, our very first step is to set the right expectation with our business partners. And traditionally, that was a challenge with RPA because everyone thought that when robots enter the world, robots will change everything and they can replicate exactly what a human can do. And you know, they, they learned quickly that robots have their limitations and while they're great workhorses, they they like the intelligence necessary to think and therefore it can only be used for a number of use cases. Um, and, and I think the same is now applying for intelligent automation. So the expectation setting fact is real, uh, although it's different. We're now setting expectations with artificial intelligence and the capabilities of these brand new tools. So intelligence is now here. However, we have to set the expectation that um, you know, the outputs are never going to be as black and white as Used to be, it's never going to be a, an absolute yes or an absolute no. There's ambiguity, and trying to sell that to our business partners to get them on board has been a bit of a challenge. Um, but the good news is, when they start to see the actual results, when we do pilots and POCs, they really get on board. So, so that's been the initial um, challenge that we started to see right out of the gate. Perfect, perfect. When you start to think about some of the more complex use cases, right? I think that what we've seen is RPA can, can fairly quickly take out some of the low hanging fruit, right? There's some, some very immediate gains from those first few use cases with RPA. As you start to transition towards sort of the, the second order problems, the ones with more complexity, the ones that had sort of a decisioning component, um, talk about how MetLife went about, you know, selecting those use cases and evaluating what was in the market to, to possibly be able to solve those things. Because I know that the way you guys did it was, was really interesting and I thought very effective. Yeah, no, happy to talk about that, right? So uh, the, the good news is that at MetLife we started already with the foundation of knowledge around data digitization. So we had a tool that perform structured data digitization. And so for some of our simple templates and other forms that, that, that don't change their structure, we were able to digitize that. And that gave us a bit of a foundational knowledge in terms of what the industry has to offer. Now, um, we wanted to go beyond that. And so we started to recognize that with all these use cases for structured data, we were seeing a, a graveyard of probably more cases that we can't use because the structure was just not there. And so we started working with our innovation team to say, hey, we're recognizing that there's a problem here. There's, there's a use case that we can't quite put our finger around, but we have a lot of these um, use cases that we're just unable to perform well because the, the data is not as structured. And the innovation team went out and said, okay, well, let us begin to find some opportunities, some, uh, for, some technology vendors that might be able to support this particular problem set. And so over time, what emerged is that there was a very clear problem here. And the 
problem was that data was locked away and all of this unstructured content. And so we, we needed a way to get at it, right? Not, not only to just digitize it, but to, to do thoughtful analytics on it, to categorize this information and to be able to um, uh, produce insights out of the information. So working with the team, uh, we collected about a dozen different best in class providers. And on our side, on the automation side, we provided uh, two very difficult use cases to really test the, the, the upper limits of all of these providers. And we went about doing this in RFP bake-off, if you will. And in that bake-off, we gave this, uh, a very difficult set of use cases to all of our vendor providers, and we gave them a set of rules for them to uh, come back to us. And uh, we gave them some time. And each provider built a model and then demonstrated that model in real time to see, you know, without um, any smoke and mirrors, what they would be able to produce, show us real time, and then give us the results so that we can examine those. And, um, you know, no surprise, uh, the, the results came through. Indico was one of the top performers so far. And that was a very exciting thing for us. And so what was good about the way that we went about this path is that we established a baseline with which we can rank and sort all of the other providers that may come through in the future. And we're able to rate them against the, how well they're able to uh, solve for these, these pair of use cases. Um, and so, you know, we were able to narrow it down to our provider. Indigo, of course, came out on top. And, and I think it was really for two reasons. One is um, the output and the performance, right? The that we received from you guys in terms of the, um, the actual use cases and how well you were able to do that and how quickly you were able to do that, in addition to some of the extra features and functions that, that were quite attractive. But I think also number two, and, and I, I, don't, um, I don't ever want this to get lost because it's such an important thing, is that working, the, the customer relationship and the customer experience that we had with Indigo has been incredible. And it's not from my words alone. It's, it's all the other business partners that we've worked with that have had such a great experience working with you that, you know, that has a, a really big impact on how successful you can be in a relationship going forward, right? You may have the best technology in the world, but if it's a difficult and contentious relationship, it's never going to work well. And I think that it's been amazing working with you guys. And, you know, our, our business partners have said the same in terms of your ability to help out and do what you can to make it successful. No, that, that's great to hear. And, and you know, I think that um, the way use cases are presented, it's vital to sort of have a, a framework for, you know, understanding what's, what's possible and, and, and what is solvable. In your role in, in the sort of MetLife Center of Excellence, um, how have you structured it to be able to collect those use cases from stakeholders and map those to, to the right vendor solution? Because it sounds like you guys have really developed separate in some way just separate disciplines between rpa and ipa in that the use cases and the approach are are, are unique it, talk about that a little bit yeah good question right so um you know rpa and, and ipa they're, they're definitely different right um but and the way that i like to describe it is that rpa simulates human action uh, and ipa simulates human intelligence there is a lot of validity in putting those two together and you see actually the best of both worlds come through when you're able to, to combine a lot of those things but um, our engagement model has probably been one of the, the keys to our success over the long run and so as a, a center of excellence we've been at this for a better part of about five years um, starting at the ground with RPA and now eventually scaling ourselves to the point where we're onboarding best-in-class IPA tools and we do that through a three-pronged approach um, the first is engagement. And so that's where we work very strategically with business units to understand what their opportunities and problems are. And we amass a large use case list, a list of use cases that we can apply automation to. That's part one. Once we've um, gone through that whole list of use cases, then we're able to then filter down and narrow down which technology should we apply that would be our best fit in order to actually solve for that use cases. Uh, most often, it's maybe one technology. Sometimes it's, it's two or more. Um, and so we were very thoughtful about how that process may look. And, you know, there's a lot of key indicators with respect to the use cases that can initially lead you down the path of the right tools to use to get the job done. So is the data structured or unstructured? You know, starts to help you understand which, which, uh, uh, which direction to go. Um, and the degree of complexity is also another thing. 
Uh, we also recognize that you know, data scientists have an opinion too, and so we actually bring them in to understand how and, and where we might be able to unlock more value. So first piece is in, we, we work with those lines of business, we understand their needs, we, co we collect a large list of use cases, and then we begin to evaluate them for the different technology needs that they have. Then the second piece, because we're a center of excellence, we also perform the delivery. So we build these solutions for the customers and we then deploy it. And then the third piece is the support model. So once it's deployed, we help to support. I should note though, Tom, that this is a rapidly evolving model because while it has been successful up until now, we're beginning to see a trend where the businesses want to have more control. After we identify the use cases, and traditionally we would go to a delivery model, the businesses are beginning to ask if they could be the ones to own the tools, if they could be the ones to deliver on the model. And that's again where Indico actually is coming in handy, right? Because um, what, what you offer is a, a UI and you offer a training that makes it pretty easy for just about anybody to be able to leverage this technology. And so this, this federation trend that we're beginning to see we're trying to get ahead of it by having the right technologies which have um, business user friendliness that enable this whole citizen developer thing that we're starting to see come through and, um, and you know, make that successful. While, while we're able to still maintain our COE model, we can work, find those opportunities, we can support them if they need the support for delivery, we can help to train them as necessary. And then once they've built and they're using their model, we can always uh, provide that production support on the back end. Maybe transitioning a little bit towards use cases. Why sure. document understanding document intake is is not a new problem, right? It's a decades old problem, and insurance companies, you know, in, in many ways, are fueled by documents. Uh, it, it is a document centric business. Um, why do you think it's been so difficult a problem to solve historically, and and why you can talk about the importance of of solving work to MetLife in terms of your overall you know operational efficiency goals. Yeah, sure, sure. I, you know, the, the, the statement piece here is we've identified almost $100 million in hard value, hard dollar saves that we can uh, very quite easily achieve over the next three to four years using unstructured data digitization and analytics tools. So, you know, that's just like the headline of how impactful this is. Um, you know, why does MetLife, a, a very old insurer, need this kind of solution? We're a 152-year-old company. And as you can imagine, up until very recently, it's been a non-digital world, right? And so we have just millions and millions of pages of unstructured content, whether they be long form contracts or messy documents that don't have a, a standard template or standard structure. Um, and even, you know, more recently, you know, half digital and half non-digital documents, invoices and, you know, scanned fax forms and all this other kind of stuff. It's just a, a huge mountain of data that's out there. And at the same time, MetLife has invested a significant amount in our data science um, population, right? So we have a ton of data scientists that are here to just drive support change and to drive new insights and things like that. And so the most important thing for these data scientists is data. And up until very recently, all that data has been locked away and we've been unable to do anything with it. Uh, save for a very manually intensive and time-consuming exercise of going through this, um, you know, as, as a regular person. But th that's just not um, scalable. So the, the problem has been there for a very long time. We've been looking to try to solve for this for a very long time. And going forward, the only way we can maximize our investment in our data science population and maximize the investment in and how we want to uh, grow initiation is by being able to unlock the insights and the, the information inside this unstructured data. So that's why it's very important to us, right? Um, you know, as I mentioned, in our COE model, we have identified nearly $100 million in, in use cases that we, were, we would be able to very easily achieve over the next three to four years. So, you know, from a automation perspective, I see it personally as our opportunity to show the rest of the world, hey, automation, this is not a fad, right? This is here to stay, and it's literally changing everything we think about with respect to our internal operations, with respect to how we're able to uh, achieve and unlock data and, and more. So, you know, that's, um, it, it's a very exciting thing. 
when you think about it, so touching on your, your points around citizen data science, uh, citizen data scientists, sorry, and citizen developer, um, I know that, you know, one of your team members, I can't remember who said it, you know, described Indico as a force multiplier for data science. Um, when you think about sort of internal data science capabilities and, and solutions like Indico, how do you how do you see those mesh together? Is it an either or? Is it an and? Um, you know, most major enterprises at this point have some internal data science capability. Why is that not the sole answer here? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, right? Um, I, you know, the good news here from a MetLife perspective is our data science organization and the automation organization work very closely together. We all fall under the same digital umbrella. And so the partnership is extremely strong. Um, what, what that, why that matters is because tools like Indico represent an opportunity to enhance what these associates are doing today. So our data scientists do a lot of their own manual development of building out different models um, you know, manually, right? They'll just open up a Python workbook and they'll just start manually building out NLP models and trying to solve for these. And it takes them weeks and weeks and weeks to try to do this on top of the fact that the amount of um, data that they need to process through the model to develop any form of good accuracy is just, you know, again, a, a huge roadblock, right? So when we're able to go to our data science community and say, keep doing what you're doing, but oh, by the way, here's a tool that will dramatically simplify your, your ability to um, get up and running. And then once you're up and running, you have many different features and functions where you're able to just understand the data that you're looking at. You're able to classify it much more effectively. You're able to extract those insights in a, in a much more effective manner. So it's been an extremely collaborative relationship. And you know, they now look to us to, to find new technologies and new tools that'll allow them to further augment their abilities. So you know, it's been, it's been a, a good partnership and I'm happy to say that now, is it, is it a bit of luck that you know, our organizations have already a very strong and, and positive partnership um, and collaboration already? It could be, but there's no doubt about it. And you know, it's something that I think is an important uh, call out here. There's no doubt that data scientists are able to enhance what they can do today because of tools like these unstructured uh, technologies that, you know, that Indico offers and that others offer. So. Perfect. How have you, you know, with the, with the advent of AI, there's some legitimate concerns around the sort of concept of a black box, right? And, and that's a governance issue. How have you thought about what's next in terms of explainability and, and governance when it comes to AI, you know, to meet the needs of your internal stakeholders and, and external around governance and compliance? How, how has that uh, started to, to come into the discussion? Yeah, it's a good question, right? So um, I, I think, again, the fact that we've had many try and figure this out has been helpful thanks to RPA and our, our proximity to um, emerging AI technologies. And so we have been operating under a very transparent umbrella for, for quite some time because the same question around um, what are these RPA bots doing in the background has been there and we've had to try and tackle that, right? So we've created a governance framework that has complete transparency into what our robots are doing today. And that took us a while to get there and it took us a while to set the expectations with our, with our business partners. And we're taking that same model and we're applying it to AI. Now, obviously there's some, some uh, intricacies and complexities because we're, we're unable to always predict what the outcome will be. But the framework relatively stays the same, right? And that is making sure that when we sit down with a business partner, we're showing them what the tool is, we're showing them how the tool works, we're showing them what the tool can and cannot do, and we're setting all the right expectations up front. Once they have those expectations set and we start to produce those output, then there, you know, the next logical question is, well, um, how do I know that you know, I'm able to trust the model? How do I know that I'm able to trust the, the output that I'm getting? And again, it's a combination of two different things. Number one, the initial thing we, that we do is um, human verification. So we'll actually have, uh, when we deploy some processes, a human side by side showing that the production process that we automated and the human who's still doing it manually are producing the same output or they're generating the same results. And that goes a long way in helping to establish the faith and the trust. 
And then the second thing that we do is we maintain an open communication channel to those businesses to continue to show them why we're doing and how we're doing what we're doing at, at a bit more of a technical level. And, and so, um, you know, one thing we've learned is that we should not underestimate the technical aptitude of some of our uh, business partners because they, they do want to learn more. They do want to dive in and they are able to keep up with um, a lot of our technology and digital partners with respect to the, the conversation that they have. So by inviting them to the conversation and showing them what is happening, they're able to also gain that other level of trust. So that's kind of how we've been working around it. And uh, so far, so good. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's across the board become a more important conversation um, that, that we certainly heard as, as customers begin to deploy AI, this is an obvious next set of questions. When we may be pushing the, the horizon out even a little further now, what do you see as you look at sort of horizon two for uh, MetLife in terms of automation and, and IPA? What are some of the, you and I have had some fun conversations about some use cases that are, uh, uh, that are, plausible, right? And, and that you're starting yeah. to hear from the business. What, what are some examples there? That's right. That's right. So I think the next uh, horizon in terms of IA, we're going to start to look at the ability to digitize and understand um, uh, pictures, right? Images, image content is, is a very different animal versus text-based content in terms of, a, you know, a, a, in a, a tool's ability to digitize and then run insights on it. Um, again, that's also why we're working closely with, with Indico is because of your ability to, to actually um, trailblaze into this area of um, video and image capture and being able to actually produce insights, right? To classify and to show differences in, in images and things like that. Um, we actually haven't found many others at all that, that can do that. Um, so kudos, whatever you're doing there. Um, but, you know, I, I think that the next frontier is really around image and video recognition and being able to extract data and information and insights out of that. As an example, use case, we're working with our PNC organization to be able to classify different types of damage that may occur on a vehicle. And so we have a, an original set of images on a vehicle, and we're able to work with you guys to um, input a, a new set of images and we can do a quick compare to see if there's any damage that may have been pre-existing or new damage to that vehicle and much more quickly and effectively offer out claims. Um, the second component, which I, I don't think the industry has tackled this at all yet, and so I'm still excited to see when, when, I, when I hear it from you or when I hear it from the rest of the industry, is the, the realm of unstructured handwritten data. And, and this is a, a very difficult problem, but I think that it's probably the last remaining problem. And if we begin to see organizations like yours um, tackle that, I, I really think that the sky's the limit because the final piece of where we're going is true end-to-end -end automation without question, right? RPA was able to bring us to maybe 50, 60% on average of process automation. IPA is now bringing us to 70, 80%. And I believe that tools like yourselves will, will begin to get smarter and smarter and allow us to do more of the thinking automation to the extent where we're actually getting to 95 and maybe 100% automation of any process that comes through. And Tom, I, I just want to recognize that there are a couple of questions in the, uh, in the dialogue box. W would we like to take a couple of those questions? Perfect timing. Yeah, let's transition to the questions. Um, sure, so sure. Let's, so uh, let's take a look. Okay, uh, so, so let me start at the, the, the first question we have here. So question is, uh, what were the top three use cases identified and which of those three were more, uh, the, which of the three was the most complex to automate? So um, three use yeah. cases. The first is around contract analytics. So we're working with Indico and our, and our group benefits providers um, to analyze very long form contracts. These are contracts that are 25, 50, 100 pages in length. And we're able to extract a lot of key insights and information, as well as ask questions and, and query against these documents. Um, this is traditionally a process that has taken a very, very long time. We have um, you know, a staff that has been around for years and years that is doing this and also represents risk, right? So if we lose that staff for any one reason, we lose a lot of knowledge that has remained there. And so we're able to actually use Indico to um, ingest all of these contracts to extract key insights that we traditionally would have had to go through manually to um, query against these contracts 
to find the gold versions of these contracts and to do much, much more. And, you know, thanks to working with you guys to actually create a UI to help us to um, investigate what we want to get at inside of those documents. So contract analytics represents a huge opportunity for us. Um, the second one is around customer onboarding and customer processing, right? So we have another organization that um, receives uh, customer documents over the period of about six months, and they come in very sporadically. And um, they're manually reviewed each time they come through, almost from the start. So we're working with uh, yourself, Pitico, and Tom. We're working with you guys to be able to automate that review process. So as these documents come in, our associates don't have to go through the, the uh, painstaking process of you going through each document again and again. They're able to you know, quickly compare, identify if anything has changed. They're able to extract any key value information. And then we're able to port that information back into the systems that need it so that we can get things moving. And this has been extremely helpful. Um, the third one that, it, uh, that is important to us is claims processing, right? So claims processing is a huge thing. Um, we've been doing claims processing for RPA for quite a while, but we're beginning to move to the next realm that, requ that requires intelligence. And um, right now we're going through a process where we're trying to classify and triage a lot of inbound um, claims responses. So as we submit uh, claims, whether they're approved or denied, we get a lot of responses back. And this is a common email that we have. That common email is now being scanned and we're able to identify what the um, you know, what the issue is for, who, who's the claims person, uh, where do we have to triage this to, and also offer up a couple suggested answers. So another very promising opportunity. Um, I, I, you know, the, the, the second part of that question is, which was the most complex? To be honest, they, they all have their own individual complexities that, you know, they're all complex. <laughs> you know, nothing, nothing's easy. Um, you know, one could be from the perspective of the, the quality of the documentation, right? And so while it may be an easy end-to-end -end, uh, business problem to solve, the document quality is extremely poor. On the other end of the spectrum, you may have very good quality documentation, but we're looking for extremely nuanced types of information inside of those documents, which has made it a, a, a more complex use case. And then in the third one, we're trying to stitch a whole bunch of um, pieces of a process and make it flow seamlessly. So that's more on the process side. Yeah. Well, Sean, this is excellent. I think we're at time here. Um, hopefully the audience enjoyed this uh, terrific detail on, on a, a really rich new area of opportunity. You know, the, the $100 million um, savings opportunity you outlined is, is, is really profound and, and speaks to uh, the power of automation. So. Thank you so much for, for joining me here uh, this morning. Hope everyone enjoyed it, and we'll pass it back to Jordan. Thank you so much, Thank both. You. Uh, before we take the, the main stage, I do want to know if you have, we, we do have two minutes left, so do you have any closing statements? I, I know, Tom, if, if you have any thoughts or insights around what so much of what Sean's shared today, he's, he's a wealth of fount, uh, fountain of knowledge, so any closing thoughts? Yeah, I, I think from, from my perspective, and I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Sean wrap at the end, from my perspective, um, I think Sean touched on it, uh, this is a, a, a collaborative effort, right? It still is not a, a you know, just throw it over the wall and, and, and come back with an answer. You have to collaborate deeply around the use case and, and framing the, the efficiency opportunity um, between, um, between the vendor partner and, and customer and you know, we certainly found that the Health Life team is is very willing to do that, and, and that's made a, a huge difference in, in making this successful. Um, I don't know, Sean, if you had closing uh, perspectives too. Yeah, the, the closing perspective I have is that um, the, the federation is the future of automation, and enabling the business to be able to do their own automation is where this is going to go. And so we need to look at tools that enable the business user to provide their own automation. That's why we're so excited about Indico versus other tools that we may have to do our own heavy lifting or involve IT with, with a significant degree of um, heavy lifting, right? So that's what I'm most excited about. That's why I'm looking forward to continuing our relationship with Indico and with, uh, with the rest of the overall uh, automation industry. Thank you Thanks so much, much gentlemen.